Welcome to Gritability, a podcast about the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. I'm your podcast host, Adam Clausen, and with me is the beautiful and ever radiant Ro Clausen. Hello. Hello, hello. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, we're picking up on a story that we started to tell, but never followed through. Imagine that. We got sidetracked. Us? Huh. Me? Distract us? Take us down <laughs> a wrong road? Um, yeah, we teased it a couple times, and then you did an interview recently where part of the story, that within the story, I'm just teasing more and more the and more. The story <laughs> within, within the, the story. story. Because there's layers, right? There are. There are. Yeah. We've, we've told the big story a number of times. But man, to get into all of the smaller stories and, and the depth that we can go down, different rows that we can go down, uh, there's so many things that we haven't explored yet. Yeah. Are you guys ready? Because we're just going to delay this a little bit longer. <laughs> we don't even know what we're talking about. So we want to tell the story of the last two weeks before Adam came home, because it was like this super high, high, and then this super low, low, it was like a crash. And then we kind of felt like we had to climb our way out of it. It wasn't just like, Adam's coming home. They open the door. Yay. It was tumultuous to say the least. But before we start with that story, we have kind of a sponsor today. So um, back, it's going on two years ago, and I'm telling you guys that specifically for a reason, a company called Rose Forever reached out to me to see if they wanted to collaborate or if we wanted to collaborate with them. They make these beautiful bouquets of roses. And what's cool about them is, first of all, they're all handcrafted, but they're supposed to last the way that they're um, cured or whatever it is for up to a year. But the reason I said that they reached out to me over two years ago is because I still have the bouquet that I got then. And it's over two years because I was very fresh, freshly pregnant when they reached out to me mm -hmm. and I got colors that I wanted to put in the nursery. And I remember I chose a color. I didn't even know if it was a girl or a boy. So I chose like this pale off, like pale yellow off white color and they are still going strong. They look as good today. Beautiful. Beautiful. They're Beautiful. in our bedroom actually. Yep. Sorry, CJ, they're not in the nursery, <laughs> but two years later. So, um, I chose to work with them and I chose a black velour box with these gorgeous red roses because I was like, well, that matches the Gritability logo. We're going to bring them into the studio and anybody in the studio is welcome to use them. Um, but for you guys, they're running a huge Mother's Day sale. So I'll put the link anywhere, I guess the show notes, the description box. I don't know. I'm new to this podcasting thing. And then you can get $20 off if you use the code row and Adam. Sorry, I misspoke. It's row and Adam 20, but I will put it right here on the screen so I don't mess up. It's also in the description with the link. But the and is an ampersand. I'll put all of that in the show notes, the description, wherever I could put it for you guys in a podcast. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else besides YouTube, YouTube, it'll be in the description. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Let's go. Where are we going? We are going back to right when I found out that your sentence was vacated, meaning you didn't have 213 years anymore, <laughs> but that's it. Like you had to still get resentenced. So I vividly remember this. And let me rewind for a second. We had submitted your compassionate release fall of what, 19? Mm, sounds about right. Fall of yeah, 2019. The end, of, the end of 19, 2019. And, and Adam has said this multiple times on the podcast, but we started seeing people getting relief through this avenue using paperwork with your name on it because your the paperwork that your attorney created, please correct me if I'm saying this wrong because I don't really know the legal way to say things. So he created this kind of template, for lack of a better word, it's a motion. It's a petition okay. for relief. Okay. And yeah, he created it. Basically, it's a template. For us lay people who don't speak legalese, a template. Template. And I, the purpose was to use my case as the example and to put it out there for everyone to use. And they did. Literally thousands and thousands of people submitted this motion and many of them just because they didn't have the resources, they didn't have the understanding of what they needed to do to that, to file it. 
literally took it as is, didn't even take my name out of it, left my name, like put their name on the top of it, but left my name in the rest of the motion and just put it in. So thousands of these motions were submitted. Um, and yeah, that was very cool, right? To know that so many people were getting relief because of what my attorney did, because of using my case as the example. But man, I was a little bit frustrating too. It was, and as time progressed and as more and more people are getting out, right? And I'm like, okay, like we can be patient. We understand this game, but it started to get really painful. Like, all right, when is this going to happen for us? Like it's been close to a year. So now here it is, July 28th, 2020. So almost a whole year later. And I know the date which, specifically. Which is 28th. That's a familiar day. Yeah. It's my birthday. <gasps> I was sitting at... On your birthday. On my birthday. I'm sitting at my desk <laughs> and I'm getting ready to do my makeup because we were going to my family's restaurant. I had my friends. I had my family. We were all going to have my birthday dinner, uh. okay? Because I take my birthday very seriously. <laughs> and I had just finished, for all the ladies listening, I had just finished my mascara. And you called. And I was like, oh, he's calling me again. Because a lot of times on my birthday, as a gift, you would call me multiple times throughout the day, which if you don't understand prison wife or prison life, that's like, that's that's gold. Because yeah. we only get 300 minutes per month, Yeah, 15 minute calls. Um, that's That goes by very, very quick. For everyone else in the real world who has unlimited calling these days, unlimited minutes, it, believe me, fi a 15 minute call is the blink of an eye. And to only have 20 of those for, yeah. a, for a whole month. And that's everyone, everyone that you need to talk to. So um, I, I used to, I, I guarded those. And, and you know, Man, any opportunity that I got to, to call and talk to you, especially on a day like your birthday, was was definitely a big deal. Yeah. Oh, and I appreciated it so much. So I get this call, and I just thought it was like another happy birthday wish before I went out with my family and friends. And you said, they vacated my sentence. And I'm like, oh, my God, you're coming home. You're like, yeah. I'm like, tomorrow? <laughs> and you said, well, it's got to go back to court. But this is it. Like, we've made it. It's done. It's over. I don't have 213 years anymore. And I'm like, oh my God, I just did my mascara. I can't cry. I can't cry. <laughs> so that was a Tuesday that year. Mm -hmm. On Thursday, because I'm like, oh my God, I'm coming to see you, right? On th or I'm sorry, I'm coming to pick you up. Because what was it? On Friday was the hearing? They scheduled the hearing for Friday. Yep. So I had to be there on Friday. And your attorney was like, so he's a friend, but he's also your attorney. And he had to be an attorney, but also a friend. But he's also, for those who don't know, my attorney is a former federal bank robber who spent time in federal prison, found his passion for the law in the prison library, got out, became an attorney, ultimately became a law professor at Georgetown. Like, not just any attorney. He's an amazing attorney. He helped get the law changed and all of those things. So... He has an experience like no other attorney in this country. No one is was better equipped like to handle my case than him. Yeah, and I that's feel. I'm glad you made that point because this is in the middle of COVID. So we would have had to sit and wait if you went to court because they would have to transfer you and then you would sit and they would have to get the court date and it would take forever. But because it's in the middle of COVID, you were able to waive your right to go to trial. And you said that he's the only person on this planet that you would let represent you and you not be there and just give him the reins completely because of his background. So I'm so glad you said that or we would have forgotten to add that part. And I think it's a huge part of the story. True. Yes. So Sean's going to court for you on Friday. On Thursday, I'm like running around like a chicken without my head, right? I'm trying to pack all the stuff for me because the, the deal is I'm coming to pick you up. I'm in New Jersey. You're in Pennsylvania. I'm heading west. I'm coming to get you. And then we're heading across the country to Las Vegas. Woohoo. This has been the plan. Vegas. So, and you don't think about it. You haven't had clothing, shoes, 
<laughs> like underwear, cosmetics, nothing for 20 years. <laughs> 20 years. I mean, out here, right? So yep. I remember thinking like, oh my God, I had to get you normal clothes. But he said <laughs> he's dying to go swimming. You hadn't been in water, like submerged in water for over 20 years. So I'm running around looking for a bathing suit for you, all this stuff. And at this point now I'm like, all right, cosmetics. And I was so excited to go to that aisle that was only in Target at this point or that I knew of that was men's cosmetics. They didn't have this before you went to prison. I had never had the opportunity to buy this stuff for anybody. I was so excited. And I know you're so into that stuff. So I'm in that aisle picking out what I wanted to get for you. And Sean, the attorney calls and he's like, bro. Now throughout the week, he's trying to talk me nicely attorney Sean or his attorney side of him is trying to talk me out of going like we don't know what they're going to say they could give him a couple weeks they could give him a couple years we don't know so you probably don't want to drive six hours and I'm like but what if they do what if they're like immediately you could walk out the door and I'm not there I don't care if there's a 0.0001% chance I will be there okay well it's one thing to say it and then it's one thing to be there and you not be released but I'm jumping ahead so at this point though he's like bro I think he has a really good chance I just like I don't know if he got paperwork back I don't know what happened but something changed his mind and he's like now the friend side of him was like listen I'm like as an attorney I'm telling you 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 make up your mind like I have I can't tell you to go or not go but as your friend like I think I think there might be a chance here so if I were in your shoes I would make the drive I'm like well I'm making it anyway so next morning I get up, I barely slept I was on the phone with my friend Sarah like jumping up and down like little girls she's like oh my god this is happening because she was going through this with me her husband was incarcerated at the mm -hmm. time too and so the next day I get up and I drive the six hours and uh I am about an hour away from where the hotel room was that I was staying and I got a call from Sean and his wife, because she's also an attorney and she worked on, is this called a motion? The motion as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. So they were like, hey, like excited. But they're like, it went well. The judge opened it up saying that, okay, what would, <laughs> what would you, so Sean, and then it's the U.S. attorney? That's Correct. what it is? Okay. Yep. What would you guys say if we gave him 30 years? And at this point, Adam had served 20. And my, I felt my heart drop to my feet. I felt nauseous. And I, he goes, eh, eh, but, but, but he didn't do that. You know, we both agreed. So Sean and the attorney, which is kind of unheard of, both agreed that. The U.S. attorney. U.S. The, attorney. The prosecutor. Right. Okay. So thank you. So my attorney and the prosecutor agreed on something. That rarely happens. That's what I was trying to Thank Just you. Just a point of clarity. Because I don't speak the legalese. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. So, uh. It didn't happen. We both said, like, he served plenty of time. We are all going for immediate release. But the judge wanted to sleep on it. This is Friday. He wants to take the weekend. He wants to think it over, this and that. So uh, it's open-ended. Like, we'll let you know. We don't know when he's going to come back and do it. It could be, Sean didn't say this, but for you guys, it could be he wanted to sleep on it for the weekend. He wants to come back and say, okay, let him out. Or he could say, give him 10 more years, give him 50 more years. We had no idea. Go ahead. Yeah. Just, just a point of clarity here. Yeah. It wasn't just uh, give me the weekend. It was basically, let me think about yeah. this and I'll get back to you. Yes. We were hopeful that it would be sometime soon, but the reality is think of how many people we know right now who have had similar motions, motions pending now for months or years. Yeah. Kev's has been for what, two years? Ian's, yeah. Two, Ian's, two years. Like, it could have been a very, very long time. So yeah. we didn't know what we were in for. Yeah. And you know what? This is a point that sometimes you make up your own answers to give yourself hope. Mm. And that could be a good thing because it's something to hold on to. But on the other hand, it could work against you because you hear what you want to hear. You see what you want to see. You draw your own conclusions. And I think this is a good point to make because that's exactly what I did. Okay. So I'm not going to turn around and drive five hours home. Here it is going on evening. So I'm going to stay at the hotel room and I'm going to leave in the morning. We had a friend flying from Las Vegas. He was in the air at this point. So I couldn't even tell him, turn around and go home. We had 
your co-defendant slash best friend was on the phone with me. Like I, I, I had to make all these calls. And at this point, it wasn't bad. And you had to tell me because honestly, I felt like I was going to a funeral at this point. Like I was so depressed. I have a YouTube video because I, do- I'm so glad I did. I documented every step of this journey from that day all the way to the day that you got out. And I was like so miserable the next morning. I'm like, oh, it's over, right? This was the hardest part for me. And at that point, after 11 years of ups and downs, I was like, I don't know if I could do this anymore. I don't know if I can handle these ups and downs and the rug getting ripped out from under me anymore. I might be over it at this point. And I knew I wasn't, but also the emotion was just so tough. This wasn't the first time that we had, no, this was the first time that my bags were literally packed. But metaphorically, this wasn't the first time our bags were packed and we thought you were coming home. And I didn't know how many more times I could take it. So drive all the way home. Okay. Now this is still the middle of COVID. I'm still working from home. Monday morning, I'm like, I I, I don't have it in me. I'm just going to go to work. I'm not even going to unpack my car. Hoping we heard from the Well, I heard from Sean that he heard from the judge that something had been granted, nothing. Tuesday morning, I wake up, I'm like depressed, made myself, well, I was starting to make myself breakfast. So I have the blender on the counter. I said, after I eat breakfast, I'm just going to log into work, eat breakfast, then I'm going to unpack the car because this obviously isn't happening. Okay. It's about nine in the morning. My phone rings and it's Sean and he is so excited. His wife is screaming in the background, happy screams. He goes, Ro, Ro, they gave him immediate release. And I was like, okay. And he was like, he's like, Ro, like this is happening. They gave him immediate release. Like he can come home. And I was like, all right, so what do I do? Do I go get him? And like, and now looking back, I'm like, he probably thought I was a lunatic, insane. Like this is the moment you've been waiting for, fighting for, for over a decade, Adam over 20 years. And you're like, okay. But at that point, I was so emotionally drained that I was like, I'll believe it when I see it. So I said to him, so what do I do? Do I drive back up there or should I wait? What do I do? And he said, no, go, like get in the car and go. I left the blender on the counter and I got in the car. I like, I hopped in the shower, took my clothes out of the dryer, threw them in the bag, got in the car and I left. About 10 minutes into my drive, I had just gotten onto the highway, Sean calls, row turn around. And now I start laughing. Like, how many times is this going to happen? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I read the paperwork and he has to come home. They have to give him 48 hours, right? And then in real time, he's reading this while I'm on the phone driving. He's like, wait, wait, wait. It says he has to be released within 48 hours. 72. I'm sorry, 72 hours. Thank you. So I'm like, what do I do? He's like, I don't know. Hang on. Let me call the judge. I'll call you back. I'm like, fine. At this point, I'm like, you know what? I booked the hotel room. I'll make a weekend out of this. I need some time away. It's August. I can hang out by the pool if nothing happens. Like mm. it's two days What's or three days. What's the difference at this point? I know I'm coming to get you. There's no point in me driving back and forth, back and forth, right? Well, this persisted for the remainder of the day. Talk about like, think what an amazing attorney. I am not exaggerating. I must have been on the phone with him back and forth at minimum 50 times in those 72 hours between me, your mom, because then you needed a place to stay. Well, hold on. Yeah. Let's, let's back up before you get too far, because what you said about when that news came through, like your response to it was like, yeah, okay. It was um, it was too much at that point. It yeah. was It was basically a sense of disbelief, right? Well, let me share my side of it. Yeah, please. Because I'm in the same boat. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'm going to get this decision anytime soon. I don't know if it's going to be weeks. I don't know if it's going to be months. So I'm trying to continue to go about my routine. And at that time, you know, this is during COVID, there was a small group of us that were permitted to go out to work. And at that time, I'm working down in the carpentry shop. Want to know what I was doing down there? Making jewelry boxes? I was making special projects for the staff. Oh. But that's a whole nother story. So I'm down there in the carpentry shop. There's only five of us down there. And these are guys, since there's only five of us, like we've all gotten pretty tight. We're down there, you know, close-knit group. But it's a huge shop. 
And I happen to be walking across the shop and I hear there's a buzzer to get in the door. Now, only the officer that's in there with us has the key. I mean, there's other people that have the key, but pro he's generally the only one that's got the key. So I'm walking across the shop. I hear the buzzer. I look over and I look down this hallway and I can see at the end, there's, you know, a door and it's glass. Like I can see in there and I'm like, that looks like my case manager. And it's the guy from R and D receiving and departures. And I like, stop. I'm stuck. I'm like, they got to be here for me. There's like, why else would they be here? They're like, there's no movement going on at this time. Very little movement on the yard. Things just aren't happening. So I, I stop and I'm standing there. I got my coffee because I was going to the hot water dispenser to get some for uh, fill up my coffee. And I just, I'm standing there and there's no emotion, no reaction from him. So the officer who's working there in the shop comes out, looks at me and I'm like, they're at the door. And he looks at me like, everything okay? And he goes down and he pops the door and they're like, yeah, Clausen. So he looks at me and obviously he knows that I'm waiting on something. He knows what's been going on. I kind of filled him in and they just come walking towards me. And I vividly recall this. Now, I've been at this facility for over a decade. These people know me very well. I'm, I'm not a low profile guy to begin with, but I'm a high profile inmate on a small compound of only, you know, 1100 people at the time. And this happens to be my case manager. She knows me very well. And they come walking up to me and they're like, so you ready to go? And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, you ready to go yet? I'm like, what, what are you talking about? What are you, are you trying to tell me something? They're like, yeah, you got immediate release. Are you ready or what? And I was like, don't play with me. They're like, no, come on, let's go. And I was like, I have dreamed about this moment, right? Like, this is it. This is when like all of those, you know, dreams that I've had about what this moment feels like, how I respond, and I'm just stuck. I'm stuck right there in the moment. And part of it was in the delivery. Yeah. Right? Like they weren't especially happy for me. Um, and it just kind of, after all the highs and lows and like, what, is this real? Is it actually happening right now? And I was just kind of stuck there. And as it started to sink in, I'm like, oh God, like, what do I do? What, what do I do with my cup? Like I have tools out, like the practical side of me kicks in and I'm like, I, man, I got to put my tools away. They're not going to let me out of here without my, without putting the tools back in the cage. Um, so I start turning to walk away and the guys in the shop are looking at me because they know that I'm waiting on this news. And listen, they wanted it for me, like just as much as, as I wanted it for myself. Everybody's looking for that, you know, that, that spark of inspiration, that sense of hope. And Dante, who's, Man, Dante's, he's bigger than me, taller than me, big guy. He looks at me and he's like, you got it? I was like, yeah, immediate release. And man, he just bursts out, starts crying. He grabs me, he's hugging me. And I'm like, man, I was like, it doesn't seem real. He's like, come on, man, we got to go. Like, let's get you out of here. And at this point, like it's starting to set in. But the two of them are over there and they're like, yeah, you just got some paperwork that you need to do. And, and that's it. Like, you'll have to go back to the unit, get your stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, let me put this stuff away real quick. Like, let's get out of here. And so as it's becoming more real, like, I guess there's a sense of urgency, like it's time to go. Like, I can't wait to come tell you. And then I'm like, does she know like what's going on? Yeah, I remember too hanging up the phone with Sean and just, you know, if I sent email, sent Adam an email, it would take an hour and a half for you to get it. But I just, I was taking the clothes out of the dryer, right? And I just remember all caps writing, immediate release, send, 
something along those lines or like call me something like that. But I want to go back to what you said about you froze in the moment, right? When you got the news, because I just want to put this out there for people who don't have any involvement in this life, right? So when people get out of prison, usually there's a release date that's pending. Like I have five months, I have three months, I have three weeks and then on and on, right? So you make plans for release. And I always said like, we couldn't do that. Our dreams for the future were literally just dreams. And to some people, they were pipe dreams. So I couldn't like look for a house for us or someplace to move into because number one, I didn't know if and when that was ever going to happen. But number two, it got really depressing. So for you to be stuck in that moment, like uh, the practical stuff, what do I do? Makes so much sense because you couldn't prepare for what to do in that moment as much as you could. And like you said, like I dreamt about this. I saw this. I visualized this. I did that so many times. Like a lot of times, you know, when you're laying down to go to sleep and just to calm yourself down. So you drift off to sleep. I would visualize that moment and it didn't <laughs> happen in <laughs> any way whatsoever what I visualized. And you just said the same thing. It's crazy. Mm. So back to that, right? I'm talking to Sean, back and forth, back and forth. And he says, Ro, we need a place for Adam to stay or for you guys to stay in Pennsylvania because this is in the middle of COVID when it was at its worst. The world was still shut down. And let me just make a side note. When you're driving six hours, right? I had to cut myself off from drinking water because no place was letting me stop and use the bathroom. <laughs> Right. I I remember I stopped. I pulled off. I had to go so bad because I just kept getting off at exits looking for like Burger Kings. They were shut down. Only drive throughs were open. I finally, mm. probably about 30 minutes, it's like an emergency at this point, walk into a Dunkin' Donuts. And I'm like, and thank God they were open. Right. And I said, um, I bought a coffee because I didn't want to be rude. And I was like, I need to use the bathroom. He goes, we don't have a bathroom. I was like, what are those chairs stacked over up over there in front of the bathroom? I have to go to the bathroom. And he was like, we don't, we don't let people use. I said, what do you guys use? And he was like, uh, and I just started walking into the bathroom. He's like, fine. I'm like, I ha and then I just cut myself off, but crazy. Just side note. So mm -hmm. Sean says they're going to make him quarantine. It's in the order. He has to be quarantined in two weeks for Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania. But if he can't find a place. They're going to throw him in the hole, which is solitary confinement. Now, I can't stay in a hotel for two weeks. I don't want you in the hole for two weeks. I don't want to delay this any longer. These 72 hours is torture at this point. Go ahead, tell this part. How, how do we find the place? So, obviously, here's the unusual part. As all of this is happening, Sean's, like, relentless. He's relentless in pressing the facility to do their part to get me released, right? Because there were a couple things that happened behind the scenes. Here's the reality, right? I'm someone who was serving a life sentence. I had 213 years. Now, by policy, someone is supposed to look at my file every six months annually. You do a three-year review. All of these things are supposed to take place in preparation for someone's eventual release. Well, when you look at someone that has a term like I did without a release date, how much time and attention you think they gave to my file? It was pretty much like, oh, yeah, he's doing good. Now, there was a lot of things in my file that I actively went out and collected and, and had to make sure that were in there, you know, to produce a record that could be presented to the court. So I went out and got those things and made sure that they were always in my file. What I never thought about was my release address. So as part of the, the order that comes from the court, this immediate release within 72 hours, he has to be, you know, let out. But there's a quarantine attached to it, right? That says I have to stay in the state of Pennsylvania for 14 days to quarantine. It's just a crazy, like this is one of the things that was made up during COVID, right? Who cares where I would have quarantined? Right. Right, like that didn't really matter. But that's what the judge determined. I guess it made sense at the time. I'm not questioning that. But the facility, the Bureau of Prisons, took a look at my file and my release address was my arrest address. And I don't know who lived there, you know, at that time in 2020, when I got my release, but I sure couldn't go there, right? This isn't an address where I know anyone who's there. And if I sign this paper saying that that's where I'm agreeing to be released to, I'm responsible for that. 
So I am immediately violating the terms of my agreement on my release. Gives me chills. That's exactly what it would have been. And they're pissed off at me because I won't sign this paper. I'm like, there's no way. They basically wanted me to cover for them not doing what they were supposed to have done in the first place. But then they could have turned around and violated you? Well, the bureau, that the BOP would have washed their hands and said, he's not our problem. He's on supervision. He's part of United States uh, parole. But US, parole could have violated you. Parole would have violated me Damn. immediately because that's not the address that we were going to. Wow. And how many people would have signed off on that not knowing, you know, or just taking their word for it? Out of, well, how many people out of desperation? Like yeah. at this point, after everything that we've gone through, it's like, man, just let me out the door. Here's one more challenge, something else. Like we're being, they were aggressive, right? Like they made my life very, very uncomfortable for those last 72 hours. What was supposed to be, remember in my mind, like I've dreamt about this, what it's going to be like. That 72 hours was absolutely miserable. They were nasty. Oh God, they were, yeah. To both, to not only you and I, but to also Sean. Yes. Then And talk about like an incredible individual. He was not taking it. He's like, oh, do I need to call the judge again? And he did. And he did. The reason and why things got worse is because he called the judge. And now you have a federal judge calling a facility saying, what the hell is going on over there? Why are you not taking care of this? What's the holdup? I gave the order. Make sure it's enforced. Anyways, the judge had to change the order to make sure that they did what they were supposed to do. And this is where it came in. We had to find an address. So... I, and it I, had to be approved. It, it had to be an approved address by the parole office. Now, mind you, we're coming to Las Vegas but I need a temporary release to Pennsylvania. This is not how things normally work. This is like the furthest thing from normal. So the temporary office, I'm temporarily assigned for 14 days to Pennsylvania. You can imagine how much they love that. So they're in charge of me for these 14 days. They have to sign off on an address. Now, granted my case was originally out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right? You would think that I would have some addresses to, to utilize there. I didn't. I cut all ties with my past. There was no one that I could pick up the phone and say, hey, by the way, can, can I come crash for 14 days? My, can, can Ro and I come stay with you? We, we tried to do that with my co-defendant, who was in Pennsylvania at the time, doing phenomenally well. They said, absolutely not. There's no way we're going to let I mean, you go. He Sorry to cut you off. He went out of his way to make it to make it work. Well, comfortable. He took it. He took it to another level. He was like, "Listen, I'll go ahead and book us a suite at like a residence inn. You know, one of those extended stays where you guys will have it for two weeks. It was right across from where he's working at the time. He's doing phenomenally well. He's been out for a decade at this point. Track record of success. I don't know why they wouldn't approve that." But they said, nope, it's got to be someone's permanent residence. They wanted us to have a babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, they got it, right? Oh. And man, it couldn't have worked out any better for us because ultimately what happens is I pick up the phone. We're exasperated at this point. Remember, the phones, it's not that easy. I can't just pick up the phone and keep dialing. And they're not about to let you use their phones, right? Uh, they did. I, I did get some use of the phone back there, but only because the judge had called uh. and was forcing like, Hey, like figure it out, get this done. And they're like, whatever you got to do to get it done and get the hell out of here, do it. So I'm trying to figure out how to get it done. I remember I hang up, they're pissed off at me. They basically push me out of the back and I come out to the phones. I'm like, okay, let me, let me get on the, the regular phone. You know, the, the, the inmate phone, I get on and I call and I remember <laughs> you're like, we've, we've got someone. Well, let me, let me stop you for one second. Yep. Right. Because at this point, 
they denied the co-defendant. They denied the hotel. Sean's getting desperate. He goes, you know, what about Adam's mom? She's in Wisconsin, but I can maybe go back to the judge and have him change the order because it's Adam's mom. So we called her and she was devastated because it's just the way that timing worked with this whole thing is incredible. But at the time, it was devastating to her because the month before, she had moved out of her condo, which was like a couple or three bedrooms, yep. into this tiny little almost studio type of or one bedroom apartment. She's like, there's just no room for you guys. But now she's involved. She's like, I will call anybody I can. Let me see what I can do. Like she's frantic. Let me see who I can find in Pennsylvania. Okay. And a mother's love knows no bounds, right? That's right. So mom picked up the phone and was making some phone calls. And when I call you to explain like, listen, I, I don't know. I'm out of options. And you're like, hey, your mom called Marshall. And I was like, oh my God, no, no. Violation, violation. <laughs> you can't do that. That's not someone you can pick up the phone and call. And you said. And he said, yes. He said, yes. And then it was like, uh-oh. Well, wait a minute. How's this going to work? I'll drop you off and I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> who's Marshall? So who's Marshall? Marshall, I had met a couple years before while in prison, um, holding reentry events. He was someone from the community who came in and unexpectedly, he thought he was coming in to speak to staff and they brought him in and gave us an opportunity to speak to him. Those of us who were at the core of our coaching program to share what we were doing on the inside. And he was impressed. He was inspired by it. And it was after that initial conversation that he and I continued to talk. He continued to come to the facility. And one of the most unlikely people that you would see coming into a federal facility because he was a U.S. attorney at the time. He was a U.S. attorney out of Erie, Pennsylvania, who his, his statement that first time I met him was, yes, unapologetically, like I'm here to enforce the law, but I also feel that I have a responsibility to make sure that what happens to you after that law is enforced, the time that you receive, that there's support throughout that period, that something good comes out of it to ensure that you come out better than you went in, to make sure that you are better equipped to deal with life. Uh, and I admired that. I admired um, his commitment, the fact that he kept coming in, that, listen, prison's a hostile environment, right? Like, U.S. attorneys don't come in. Prosecutors don't go into prisons. It's just, no. And most of them are too afraid to come in. So, one, he had the courage to do it repeatedly. Guys respected that. The relationship that we built over time, like, that sent a very strong message. Like it gave other people permission. They'd see us talking and it wasn't just talking. They'd see like, man, there was a genuine friendship that developed there. But I wasn't privy to any of this. So I'm like, oh man, I was on the phone with Joel telling, filling him in, right? Yep. Because he's trying to find us a place. And I'm like, he's leaving jail and going to jail. Like, I don't want to stay there, right? And you have to tell this part for all the married couples out there. What was Marshall's actual, like, literal response to your mom? The literal response when my mom was like, you said if I ever needed anything to call. Well, I need something. Adam needs a place to stay. And he said, absolutely. And he's like, well, wait a minute. Let me make sure. Let me let me check with my wife <laughs> just to be certain, right? Now. All those husbands out there are like, uh-huh. Wait a minute. Just, just to put this in context, I am a repeat violent offender, right? Like I am the boogeyman. I am the worst of the worst when you talk about criminal justice. The last person that's going to get any sort of relief, which is why it was so challenging up to this point for us to get the, the attention to gain this relief. And this guy didn't hesitate, not for a second. And neither did his wife or he was like, his family. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I definitely want to get to that and, and talk about what that experience was, but guy didn't hesitate. And we should note, he wasn't in the U S attorney's office anymore. He had left the U S attorney's office. 
to become a Pennsylvania state court judge, right? So now he's a judge. We're going to stay at the judge's house. That's my release address, right? Like that doesn't even seem real. Initially, I was like a little reluctant to even tell people. Well, and then he said, though, I mean, I think that this is just the beauty of Marshall and his family, right? He said, I am not doing this for accolades. I'm doing this for Adam. So I'd prefer that my name be left out of this. Like, obviously, the judge has to approve it, but I don't want... I mean, we've obviously gotten his permission to talk about it since, but what a beautiful person. Like, I'm not doing this because I'm up for election. I'm not doing this to get glory or anything like that. I'm doing this to help out a friend and somebody who deserves it. Yeah, truly, truly remarkable. Remarkable. And, um, wow. Okay, so we let's let's rewind though, because yeah. I was just about to talk about pulling up there, but you didn't get out yet. So we have the place to stay. I tell you, you're like, oh no, I said he said yes, and I'm like, I'll drop you off and see you in two weeks, and then you talk to me into because I have like visions of us like sitting with a judge in their living room. Like I just felt like it was going to be so awkward, but of course I'm joking. I would have never left you there for two weeks by yourself. And then what was this? This was day one, right? So we're like 24 hours in. Or is this day two? I don't remember. Oh, I don't, I don't. They're dragging. I don't even know what the time frame was. This was probably at least into, well into day two. Day, day two. And they, they were supposed to release me by the end of day three. So here we are. Uh, the, the first day has gone by. And just like incessant calls back and forth. We're trying to figure it out. Um, frantic. I, I was burnt out, go to sleep, get up and do it all over again. And I think it was at the end of day two, we're like, okay, we got it locked in. It's not going to happen today. Yeah. I remember there was hope and Sean got off the phone with the people on the inside and he's like, Ro, he's like, it's just not going to, it's, it's not going to happen. He's like, I'm sorry. And then I, at that point was like, all right, I mean, I'm here, I'm hanging out. I just need to get some rest. At this point, I don't think I ate very much. I think maybe I was existing on coffee and a couple bites of food here mm. and there. So now day three, I get up, you and I spoke. I mean, I knew at some point it was going to happen this day, right? I just didn't know when. So I did my makeup, my hair, this and that. And it's about probably late morning, like lunchtime, no, early afternoon, lunchtime. And one of my girlfriends was like, go get yourself food because you haven't really eaten. Like you mm. need to stay strong. You need to be healthy. So the only place in this town, we were like in the middle of nowhere, Desperadoville in Pennsylvania. <laughs> so the only place that I could get something remotely healthy was Subway. So I stopped in and I ordered a sandwich and I was on the phone with Jess. And she's like, oh, I said, I just got off the phone with Adam. She's like, Oh, bro, I'm sorry. She goes, but the fact that they didn't shut off his minutes because Jess has done time herself, that means that it's probably not going to happen. She's like, but it's, don't worry. She's like, it's happening in the next couple of days. I was like, hold on. I'm, I'm getting another call. It's the prison. Hang on one second. And I get this call and it's the prison. And she says in this exact tone, you can come pick up Clausen now. So it's happening, right? And I was like, uh, oh, okay. And I clicked over to Jess and I'm like, they just told me I could come pick him up. And she was like, ah! she's like, Rose, stop for a second. Like you are going to pick up Adam right now. You are, this is what you waited for. And I'm like, uh, okay, okay. All right. And I'm like shaking. I'm grabbing my stuff. She's like, okay, drive safe. Cause I'm about 15 minutes away from you. I remember throwing my sandwich. I don't remember if it was in the garbage on the seat of my car. I hope not on the seat of my car. Cause it would have smelled like subway, but <laughs> I get in the car and I'm the lying I'm doing 95 down this like desolate I guess what's supposed to be a highway one lane towards you and Sean calls and he's like bro this is it it's happening you're going to pick up Adam now I'm like ah and I pull up and I have to fill out this form because it's COVID right so there's mm -hmm. this woman that's standing out at the front because you pull into the facility and it's this long driveway and then you get to this, you could either go around this little, um, I would say like a semicircle to get to the front of the prison, but the parking lot is up on the left. And then if you keep going, there's a camp up there. So the long driveway part, I, I pull up and this woman's telling me to roll down my window, this very sweet, sweet woman. And it's a clipboard and I have to just kind of fill out paperwork like I haven't been out of the country. It's COVID, right? I have to like, I have no symptoms, this and that. And she, first she says to me, she goes, you're beautiful. And I was like, oh, say it again. Thanks. And she said, wait a minute. 
she looks at me and she said, are you here to pick up Clawson? And I said, yeah, she stopped and she took this big breath and this beautiful smile. And she's like, he's a great guy. You guys deserve this. Please mm. tell him Mrs. So-and-so, I don't remember her name at this point, but Mrs. So-and-so says she's so happy. Congratulations. And I was like, of course. So I pulled up around the front. I want you to tell, I'm like starting to cry. You, you tell this part because I love the way you tell this part. Well, I'm going to back up a little bit because I didn't get the notice right away. I had actually, what happened is we had just hung up on the phone and I had been in the back, right? For whatever reason, they had allowed me to make that call from the back. You and I had talked and I come out front and I try and get on the phones and I can't get on the phones. Oh, they shut your phones off. Phones but I off. didn't know. Got it. Okay. You didn't know the phone sure. is off. So I'm like, my phone's off. That's, hold on. Let me go check my email. Email's off. I'm like, what's going on? And the one time when you need a cop, right? I can't find one. There's, there's none. The unit officer is like some rookie. He's in the back. And when I say in the back, there's like an office, but it's behind a steel door. And listen, you can't get back there. <laughs> like if they're back there doing whatever they're doing, they're going to keep that door locked. You can pound, you can bang, you can do whatever you want, but they're not answering. So I'm out there on the unit. And I'm like, man, my, my stuff is off. Like this got to mean I'm going. Believe me, at this point, everything's packed. I'm ready. I'm pacing. I'm like, you know, when is this going to happen? And I see my case manager, the same one. Remember the one that came down and told me initially, you got immediate release. And just the way that she presented it was like, this is basically the same situation. So she walks through. She's like, yeah, yeah, you can go. And I'm like, wait, what? Goes out the door and locks the door. So she goes out the front door of the unit. I'm like, what do you mean I can go? Where do I go? How the hell do I get out of here? Like, I don't have keys. So I've got my stuff, right? I'm like, oh, let me go back in my cell. Let me grab my stuff. I grab and COVID, most everybody's on the unit. And I'm like, I think I'm out of here this time for real. And so a couple people that I'm close with are right there with me. They're like, oh man, that's so, you know, like they're excited, genuinely, genuinely happy. A couple of these guys are other, they're lifers, right? They're guys in similar situation. And when I tell you like, man, people were just so happy. They were so happy for me. But I get to the door and since it's COVID, everyone's confined to the units. And, and I'm waiting. I'm like, where is this cop? And finally, he comes back around from outside, opens the door. And I'm like, I can go. He's like, I guess. And I'm like, well, you're going to have to tell me to stop. So I take off and I got a cart and my books, all these books behind me, that vision board right there, and a bunch of other things that I was insistent upon bringing with, bringing home with me. I've got them piled on this cart. It's like a, a supply cart and I'm, I'm pushing and I'm going down the sidewalk and it's like a ghost town. It's almost eerie, right? Because there's no movement. I can't see anyone. There's people in these units, but the units are a ways away. I'm walking away from them down this pathway and I'm like, man, nobody, I, I don't really get a chance to say goodbye to anybody. Now these are there's a lot of people that I've I've been here over a decade people that I'm close to um, that I'd really, I really I wish I could have had the opportunity to say goodbye I don't even know if they see me leaving so I get down and then there's this little shack where you get searched and you know you have to go through and I get down to there and there are two cops sitting in there and they got their feet up I was like hey uh, R and D they're like yeah pay me Jeez. no mind I'm like okay so I cruise through. Again, very anticlimactic, right? And I go down this long pathway that goes down to R&D the same way as if I were going to visit. And instead of just going off right to visit, I go left and I go to this door. And I get to the door and I ring the buzzer. And the same woman who called you comes over, opens the door and just looks at me. Which is crazy because she led visits so many times and she was a doll to us. She was, but... She was so nice to us under those circumstances. 
where she and everyone else was comfortable. But as soon as we made waves, as soon as Sean had the judge call, what happened is that came back on my my team, the case manager, the counselor, who never did what they were supposed to do. So they basically got called out about that. I and see. when they did, they put the word out to the rest of the gang that Clausen's Clausen's on that list. Like, don't talk to him. Make sure like he put us in a bad spot. Man, he's got nothing coming. And they they treated me bad. The, I mean, thank God this was your last couple of days there. Because imagine if this was you had a couple of years to live like this. Forget it, it. We'd never have a visit. And that happens. There are people that, when the system turns on you, man, it's it's painful. And there are people who end up isolated and and have to deal with that for years. So here I am. I make it in. I get into R and D, re, uh, receiving in departures. I'm on the D side. I'm actually leaving, right? <laughs> I'm going out. So this is a new experience. I'm like, oh God, what am I doing here? Like, what do you need from me? Let's go. And they won't talk to me. There's three of them in there. Won't say a word to me. And they're just, step over there. They take a picture. You know what I mean? They're going through processing, but they don't want to talk. They process everything out. She sends me over the two you know, talk to the other one, they leave. So it's just me and that one. And I'm like, man, like we've had a good rapport for all these years, you know, and you don't even want to talk to me. I was like, what's the problem here? She was like, you know what the problem is. And I'm like, okay. She's like, let's go. She just walks me out, out the door and we go down um, and I end up in the room where whenever you come up to see me, you and the other visitors all have to wait. So for me, that pivotal line, crossing that line was when I come through, there's different like control bubbles. So we walk down this pathway and it's like shift change. So all these officers are leaving and they look at me, wouldn't say anything and look away. And I'm just like, damn damn, everybody's on the same page. Like they're all sticking together in this. And I finally get down to this last bubble where we have to get buzzed through. The second door opens. There's a metal detector for people who are coming in, like officers coming in this way. And we walk through there and she goes, you can wait right there. I'm like, and I can go like, that's it. And let me just paint the picture of this room. You walk into the front door of this facility and it is immediately to your left, a door. And <laughs> this whole room is wind. It's a tiny little room, but the whole room is windowed just to paint the picture for you. But that's how close you were to freedom. Literally, it's an immediate left into this room. And the last time I was in that room was when I was locked in there coming in Ooh. when I arrived over 10 years earlier. So here I am by myself with my cart all alone in this room waiting for you to pull up. All windowed. That's why I added that part. All windowed. So I am technically outside of the gate, right? Oh, that's why you said that. And the door is open. So I've already made it out, but I'm like... Yeah. And on the back the back wall of that room is an exit door. Like you are outside. Yes. Like literally walking out the out the, the door. Yeah. Mm. So I'm looking down the street, this road that comes in, and I can see the checkpoint, but I'm looking, I'm squinting, it's a ways up the road. I'm like, that looks like it's a little white car. Is that it? Do you remember how long you were in that room for? Oh God. I'm sure it seemed like an eternity, but I'm just curious. Time wise, I don't know. Okay. I have no idea how long it actually was, but I was, when you got the phone call, I was there with the three women in R and D. Okay. So 15 minutes or less. Cause I asked her, I was like, Hey, does, does my wife know? Like, have, have you let her know? Like I'm being released. Like I called her. <laughs> I just called her. I'm like, Oh, okay, good. I'm glad, you know, so so here you are coming up the street. I'm like, oh God, oh God, I think that's her. I think that's her. 
and I've got my cart. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? Like, I'm ready to like run out and I see you pull up. So I'm like, I can really just walk out this door. I'm like, oh my God, they're going to let me out the door. They're really going to let me out. the. Door. So I take my cart and I, and I go out this last door and I'm outside, I'm on the pavement and I'm walking down to you. The car is right there. You get out and you come around and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And I just grabbed you. And like you said, I envisioned this moment for 10 years, 11 years. And in my dream, I'm Kim Kardashian, ugly crying, so dramatic. And this is the second time in my life this happened, right? So the first time was at my mom's funeral and wake. And it's like this calm took over my body. It was not an out of body experience, but it like, it didn't feel like me, right? And my emotions had to be put aside. And I was just able to like live and go through the motions and the moment I was living in the moment, but like, I did not cry. I knew I needed to be strong at my mom's funeral for my dad and for my family. Mm. I knew in this moment that I needed to be strong for you. You hadn't been outside in the real world for over 20 years. I didn't know how you were going to react. I didn't know how you were going to handle it. I didn't know if you were going to have PTSD. And I knew I needed to be the rock in this moment. And it just caught, I was nervous as I was nervous AF, but I was just like, calm, cool, and collected at the same time. Oh, you were. You were so cool, so calm. And I was just like, oh my God. And I think I was, I was like definitely shaken at this point. But I was also, as soon as you were in my arms, I was like, oh my God, it's real. It's real. We are outside of the prison. Here we are. I'm holding on to you. And remember, it's shift change. So there's still, there's officers yeah. coming in. They're leaving the facility. And, and I hear... Hey, Clawson, they want you back inside. Now, just to add this part, you had Chad Marks on, on the podcast not too long ago. A mm -hmm. couple months before this, I didn't know Chad. I knew of Chad, but I don't have a relationship with Chad. I just knew he was another guy that was kind of loud, fighting 924Cs, had like this whole bunch of years. And... I'm reading on Facebook, somebody had posted that Chad also got, I don't know if it was immediate release, whatever, but he got compassionate release. He's coming out and literally can see his family and they call him to go back inside. They were appealing it and they didn't let him out that day. And I remember I sat at my desk at work and I, that's when I saw that post and I started to cry, not only for Chad, but for his family. And mm. I remember telling you, I don't think I could recover from that. Like I, that might've been my exit. I say that. I don't think it would have been at that point, but like, how do you recover from that? Right? Because then he can go back inside forever Devastating. and you are right there. Right? So that's what's flashed, flashed in my mind. They said they want him back inside. I'm like, oh, here we go. You grab me so tight, like death grip. So that calm, cool, collected, like, mm. You grabbed me and in that moment, like I was panicked and I looked and I saw him start laughing. And he didn't, in his defense, I mean, I don't even know who he is, but in his defense, he didn't know about Chad. But out of all those officers, none of them who would talk to me, give me the time of day, the one that did decided to be funny and he was just joking around. Like that was his way of genuinely yeah. being funny. And if there was no chat, it would have been a funny joke. Like, right? ah. And he looked at us and I think he knew like. We're not playing around. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't funny. And we looked at each other like, let's get the hell out of here. It's time to go. And we literally hopped in the car. We're like, cram this stuff in here. Like we're gone. Stopped at the sign that says, welcome to federal prison. Took a selfie. We did. We stopped out front. We got a great picture of it. But we were even reluctant to do that. Just we, it was quick. It was quick. It wasn't the experience um, that we had planned or expected. Um, but that's how I finally made it out. And there was a lot of negativity. And I'm going to be honest, because um, I see that we're running a little long here. Uh, I carried some resentment for, for a while about that because of how respectful I was to them how we always were and to be treated like that on the way out the door. And I felt like, you know, they took that joy from us. Yeah. Part of it is I, I almost feel like I allowed them to take part of that 
which is why at at, at some point I had to let go of that. And all, are you done? Yeah. Jokes on them because that 14, 14 day quarantine was the best two weeks of my whole entire life, BC before Christian. <laughs> Likewise. Likewise. It was absolutely amazing. And the story of Marshall and his family, that's a whole nother chapter. A whole nother chapter that we'll get into another day. We can get into that another day, but I do want to, I do want to include this, that, um, although that resentment was there, uh, I think it's largely fueled like our response, many of the things that we've done since in helping to kind of work through it, sharing our story have been cathartic. It's been yeah. therapeutic to do that. And to now be at a place where because of everything that we've gone through, everything that we're experienced, we're now able to give back in a different way. And what I'm doing, the new role that I've taken on, uh, recently became the director of innovation and social impact for an incredible organization called Social Purpose Corrections. And I'm working with top former corrections officials who believe in transforming the culture in prison, doing things very differently to make sure that it's a healthy environment, that although we're there for punishment, like that time is going to be well spent, that you can work with people on a professional basis, you can build relationships, you can be supportive, co-creative, all these positive things. To be a part of that now is incredibly inspiring. And I would not appreciate it as much if we had not endured and overcome all of those challenges, especially on the way out the door. Yeah, and okay, so... I remember aside from our stop to get something to eat and people always want to know the first thing you ate when you got out. Do you remember? Cause I do. Uh, I think it was a chicken sandwich. Yeah. You had a grilled chicken sandwich. But when you got out of the car, you had like these sea legs, right? And we're not going to dwell on that, but you almost like passed out from the motion sickness. Cause think about it. You hadn't been. I was overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. S too much stimulus. Yeah. But after, literally, literally. After that, I took you to Walmart because that's the only place in this town that you could get stuff. We needed some stuff for our two-week stay. Mm -hmm. And I took you to self-checkout. And to me, that's like second nature. But that was the first time ever that you had been to self-checkout because they didn't have that. They didn't have like press ATMs or anything like that, right? Touch screen phones, nothing like that before you went in. Mm -hmm. And you handled it like a champ. And I said earlier, like, I didn't know if you were going to have PTSD. I heard all these stories. You did not and have not ever displayed any PTSD since. In fact, like I feel like going back to the social purpose corrections, sometimes I have to stop and you're telling me these things or like I'll, I'll add stuff about the family part and visits and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, my immediate response is, oh, that, that can't happen because of everything that we've mm. been through, because of all of those confines and restrictions. And you're kind of stuck in that for so long. And I love being able to add to this. And I love being able to, after taking steps out of that, think outside of the box and help move forward. Because we always said that we wanted to stay in this space and we wanted to help make a change. And this is the way we could do it. And I love that for us. I am so grateful that we're doing something that we're deeply passionate about that turns all of the negative into something positive that can potentially impact countless other families, individuals, not only on the inside, but families that are waiting for them on the outside to bring something positive out of that. That's what gridability is all about, right? Absolutely. And one last thing, every yep. time we tell this story, we add so much more detail. We just like remember more and more and more. I feel like somebody needs to share this with Mark Wahlberg, <laughs> our new Paisan, because Paisan in Italian means like you live in the same city. He just moved to Las Vegas because this is a movie. Um, I'm down with that. I'm right? ready to make the movie. All right, let's go. Let's go. Hopefully you heard that, Mark. Listen, this is another incredible episode of Gritability, the power of perseverance, overcoming seemingly insurmountable odds to attain the life of your dreams. That's what we're living now. We are living proof that literally anything is possible. 
We're here living our dream. We're grateful that you're able to join us. I'm your podcast host, Adam Clausen. With me, the beautiful, ever-radiant Roe Clausen. We'll see you back here on the next episode. Thank <laughs> you.